morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. This is another episode of todebate.net. I am Sebastian, one of your co-hosts, and in front of me over video conference, I have Dirk. We have to say thank you to one of our listeners who also posted another review on iTunes. You mentioned that to me, another person in Canada. Yeah, uh, that means three to go until all the other listeners in Canada can read the comments. Is it the comments or is it the average review score? Both, I think. But I'm not logged in into iTunes and I can read the comments and the individual scores. So so you can? can? Yeah. Okay. I, th- I think it's just the average. The average score is not displayed. You know, on the okay. left side and when oh, people maybe are scrolling that is through. Then. Oh, did I did I spread fake news? That would be another <laughs> debate if that's actually a real thing. No, it's okay. There's no such thing as filter bubbles. <laughs> anyway, we were very happy to see another comment from Canada. And oh, comments I, from Canada are always welcome, I would say. I thought you were very happy to see another new Supreme Court judge to be appointed. God, God, this was this was stressful, wasn't it? I, it surprisingly, I, I, it, I, I was because I read all, a lot of the articles prior to the hearings. I was I, I don't know why I got so much interested into it, but then I actually listened to the testimony by Dr. Ford and then by Kavanaugh. So yeah. I was like emotionally invested in this, and then like in the past few days after his confirmation, I was disappointed and lost interest completely in this and that well anyway there's nothing to be discussed anymore but yeah it, it, it was, was quite, crazy quite was crazy. funny do you like I, beer I, Derek? what was that do you like beer <laughs> <laughs> yeah i drank beer i like beer still like beer but the beer without alcohol actually because i'm not drinking alcohol but uh, I yeah alcohol. i do beer i don't know i did not know you don't drink alcohol no, I'm not, not drinking any alcohol, but occasionally an alcohol-free beer I do drink. So, but, Okay, so how do you explain that you lose all these debates with me? It, like, I thought you had the excuse of alcohol. <laughs> it's like, well, uh, uh, mental deficiency, I would say, or uh, just, uh, you, you're just so much smarter and yeah, better right. prepared than I am. <laughs> anyway, you, you, you can make me uh, appear like an arrogant prick, but I guess I'm French, so... Yeah, can't do that's much about that. That's what you keep saying. That's yeah, what you keep saying. As an saying. excuse, you know. That explains why we have no ratings so far from France. <laughs> maybe, maybe people are are fed up with you bitching their own country. But I just read this, this morning an, an article. And I was surprised that in the UK, I think thirty percent of the younger generation, so eighteen to twenty four year olds, and uh, are, are abstinent in terms of alcohol. And the percentage seems to increase. I was surprised by, especially in the UK, which is a quite of a alcohol heavy consumption country. Um, I was surprised to read this. I, I thought it was still very much of a, an exception not to drink alcohol at all, especially among the youth. Yeah, I I, w- I would have thought the same thing. Now that we are already in that beer topic um, and talked about the Kavanaugh hearing, which really stressed me out, I have to say. We watched the whole thing here, and I heard that over 20 million Americans watched it too. It's one of these moments that we probably will continue discussing for the next couple of years. This is one of those moments that will stick with us. I'm pretty yeah. sure of that. Yeah, you're right. And I didn't realize this until after, until I indeed read reports of how people, even internationally, were kind of obsessed with this. And I, I got interested. I don't know. I just happened to catch it live and then got completely sucked into it. And only realized after the fact, just what you're mentioning, that it's probably something that we're going to talk about for a, for for the times to come uh, yeah. on a number of aspects, like whether it's how do you take into account harassment claims when you don't have evidence? It's one person saying something against another person's words. Yeah. Um, anyway. There are so many layers, and that kind of bugged me too. So there's the one thing, the the claim about the sexual harassment. Then is the question of, is it a job interview or is it a criminal case? Then is the question, if it was a job interview, was he disqualifying himself by the way he acted in that job interview? And then, of course, you have the whole complex of Republican versus Democratic uh, political tactics, because the Democrats, it feels like we are holding back on purpose in the hopes they can basically push the the whole hearing past the midterm so they can make a tactical play out of this. So so all these layers and all of this is just as uh, painful for everyone to watch because we all know the guy has been appointed to a role that is set out to be for life. 
So he's literally uh, now in one of the most powerful positions in the country, and he's going to have that position until he decides to step back or dies. That's precisely the motion of today, right? All right. So the motion today is Supreme Court judges should be nominated for life. And you, Dirk, through the flip of the coin, will be against that motion and you will start the debate. And this time around, I've used a real coin to decide who will start and who will be second and who will be for and who are against the motion. So whenever you're ready, Dirk, Supreme Court judges should be nominated for life. You're against. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues against the motion. All right, we just mentioned that we were all glued to the TV screen during the Kavanaugh hearings. Now, why was that such a painful thing to watch, especially for Democrats? There's a simple reason. The painful element of that was that Judge Kavanaugh is about as conservative a judge as it can get. And everybody watching knew that he is about to be called in for a job for life. So once... Once confirmed for the Supreme Court uh, judge seat, he's going to have that seat until he dies or decides to retire. Now, this is not unusual. This is actually something that's pretty common among democracies. And the main reason for that is because the idea is to make judges as independent as possible, because the rule of law is one of the pillars democracies rest on. And it's very important to make them independent from the daily drama of politics. And I get that. On the other hand, um, if, you, if you have a judge appointed for life uh, in such a powerful position, you risk actually fixing a status quo that may be harmful for democracy as well if the government that happens to be in power and install these judges is harmful to the society it rules. And some fear that this is about to happen just now with uh, the Trump uh, administration. And in other countries, we see things happening around uh, Supreme Courts to the same tune. So um, it is a risk as much as it, it is important to have judges for a very long time. And I propose that we find a way in the middle. And the country I'm from, Germany, actually found that kind of middle ground by appointing judges for a pretty long term, but not for life. And so this is my first argument. Um, no, we should not have judges nominated for life. Instead, we should limit the terms, even though they will be pretty long term in the end. And now on to Sebastian. Let's hear his argument. We talk about Trump a lot. But here's the thing. The primary goal of that nomination for life of Supreme Court judges is for them to be able to decide cases completely free, completely devoid of external pressures, whether they're public pressures or political pressures. Trump comes and go. At most, he will stay in power for eight years in a row. And after that, he's gone. Fair enough. He can influence who gets nominated and appointed on the Supreme Court panel of judges. However, on the long run, the point is those judges can decide and they don't have any pressure from the existing or the future presidents. In fact, we have seen this in the past. Supposedly conservative or liberal judges end up voting against the president who has nominated them. This has happened twice when Nixon was around, for instance. And uh, the Watergate did not prevent the Supreme Court judges to decide on what to do when Nixon was uh, choosing some policies to be implemented. Here's the thing. The additional aspect is that these judges provide long-term stability for the country. They accumulate knowledge. They accumulate experience. They're recognized for that. They understand the law very, very well. In fact, in the case of Kavanaugh, there was no doubt about the quality of his experience. He may, he may be a devout Catholic, he may be a conservative, and he may have temperament issues, but that was not the point. The point of the debate today is whether he should be, or others, be nominated for life or not. And that, by the way, they are not exempt, these judges, from judicial investigation. Um, if I'm not mistaken, if they commit a crime, uh, they can be liable uh, for damages and pursuits 
it depends if it comes into the practice of what they actually do as part of as part of a judge or outside of their activities as a judge. This lifetime term provides job security and this allows them to do what is right under the law because they don't have to fear that they will be fired. Look at what Trump did with his staff members. As soon as he does not agree with them, he fires them. He fires the FBI director. He fires the various you know, communication secretaries. These judges will not have to fear someone like Trump precisely. So this is why Supreme Court judges should be nominated for life. Now, it's Dirk's turn. Let's hear his rebuttal. Yeah, I recognize the core idea that you were bringing forward here. The fact that Supreme Court judges are nominated for life guarantees that they are independent from the daily drama of politics and protected. Uh, Questions like a salary are taken off the table. I totally get that. And so I'm not suggesting that we nominate them for a short time. Actually, I do think one value of Supreme Court judges is that they can work on issues that sometimes span decades. So some of the big top, uh, big ticket items that are decided in Supreme Courts are usually things that were brewing and fought over years over years over years. So it, it helps that they have a a timeless perspective on the matter. It helps that they don't have to be scared of being fired. All the aspects that you say. The only point I'm making is, this is not to say that they need to be appointed for life. And actually, it becomes quite ridiculous that they are appointed for life, if you think of it. Um, I give you an uh, an example. Um, the, the judge Brett Kavanaugh is replacing, Anthony Kennedy was over 80 years old. Brett Kavanaugh is... Just just a little over 50, 53, I think he is. So that means he's on that court for 30 years. And that's not to say that uh, this is a, a guarantee to be a high quality term. I, I do think uh, nobody really checks those judges for the qualities of their ruling or anything. They are in those jobs and it takes a really, really high uh, effort to get them out of that job if they are starting to be weird. Uh, Dementia sometimes kicks in uh, over 70 as well. Um, If they are not feeling that well, then things get delayed. Um, it It is a weird construct. The pure idea to have people for decades in that job feels odd to me. And that is why I propose to have a middle ground. And the middle ground would be something like Frankly, I don't I don't like citing Germany as an example, but the term is limited to 15 years. 15 years is a damn long time. You can feel pretty safe if you're in term 15 years. And that would be a much better system. And it allows for correction of errors. It allows for people dropping out of the Supreme Court that are just too old to keep ruling. And it takes off some of the edge that we felt in the Kavanaugh hearings that are basically coming from the scary thought that things are fixed for a really long time once you appoint somebody to the Supreme Court. So uh, still, I maintain my position. It's not a good idea to have judges appointed for life. Now it's Sebastian's turn. Can you address head on your point about term limits and the fact that you bring up the German model it doesn't have to be specific to Germany, but you give the example of 15 years as being long enough. I'll give you one very strong counter argument to why this is, I think, damaging and potentially harmful. Here's the thing. As they sit during these 15 years, for instance, these judges could attempt during that time, to become lobbyists. I'll give you an example. Let's say smoking or alcohol, right? They could think about their career after these 15 years and they could orientate all their decisions based on what they're going to do afterwards. Let's say I want to join a tobacco company after I give rulings. I could, every single time, judge something and make decisions which are going to favor that industry and make it very easy for me to convert back into that industry or into that industry after my 15 years. So that create uh, a, a very big potential conflict of interest and could also create a massive public relations nightmare, by the way. So I think that's one of the reasons why for judges specifically, especially for something like a Supreme Court, you don't want them to be uh, suspect of 
being prone to conflicts of interest. And that's why term limits are can be extremely damaging. You will never know uh, whether they're influenced by what they think about their next move, their next career, because they know they would they would know by definition that they their career ends at the Supreme Court after some time. Additionally, there's nothing in the US Constitution actually promising these judges lifetime appointments. The language is they shall hold their offices during good behavior, which is open in terms of interpretation. It doesn't say lifetime nomination. So it says you can stay for life, or it's implying that, but it doesn't say you have to. And in fact, as you mentioned, some judges have decided to retire. Or in France, in the case of the uh, Constitutional Council, which we call Conseil Constitutionnel, um, ex-presidents are allowed to sit for life, but some of them have decided not to sit at all. So, of course, in that case, we rely on them deciding. But I'm not against introducing things like, oh, if the health and is is declining if there's dementia in that case they should be taken away from sitting on the supreme court it doesn't uh, change anything to the fact that we allow them to sit as long as they have uh, all their mental abilities it's the same case by the way for the u.s president uh, i think there's this 25th amendment uh, which was discussed recently in the news by which if the president is declared unfit he will be taking taken off uh, his presidential seat so uh, there's nothing contradictory in still having nomination for life of these judges to protect society from uh, potential conflicts of interest and undue lobbying, but also take into account the health of these people. Um, and one final note, uh, and I want to be very careful about age discrimination. Um, some countries force retirement of public officials when they reach age 65, 70, 75, whatever. And I'll just end up with this old joke. Uh, Elon Musk is only 47 years old and he's completely nuts. So it has nothing to do with age. We can have judges for life. That's not the problem. Final statements. Dirk goes first. 15 years is a long time, my friend. If, you're, if you take Brett Kavanaugh, he's 53 now. Last 15 years is 68. Most of them will retire anyway, um, if given the chance. I don't think that this is such a big, a, a big problem as you make it sound. The other aspect, age discrimination. We, we do have uh, Supreme Courts as the French model, as the UK model, as the US model, that where, where judges are appointed for life. So they get appointed at age 50-something, and they stay in position until 80, 90 of age. I don't think age discrimination, Megaforth, that's very healthy. Uh, I, I have doubts if people can perform at such a high level all those decades. I have doubts if people are really that good in judging when they are that remote and removed from society. For better or worse, um, the idea is to remove you from the daily drama. The downside of it is you're removed from the daily drama. So after two or three decades, you're bound to rule based on a rule set that you develop. I'm not convinced that this is the best idea. So uh, we should have term limits, 15, maybe 20 years max. And that's about it. Not 30, 40, 50 years as we see right now. Sebastian. Although that's not part of the debate today, since we're talking about judges, it's funny you mentioned that at 68, after 15 years of sitting and as a judge, he would not want to have any career. The interesting thing is the head of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, Grassley, Senator Grassley, is 85 years old. Senator Feinstein on the Democratic side is 85 years old. So I'm not too sure you can say uh, with much assurances and confidence that they would not want to have a career. And if you're doubting their intellectual abilities, then we have to consider a lot of things beyond just judges, whether they are fit for any kind of office. Um, but uh, this age part uh, aspect apart, I just want to conclude and summarize two key points I made here. Number one is, the primary goal for nom of nomination for life is to free people from external pressures, political and public. Right? If the public is going one way, this is a very short-term emotional trend. They are there to have to impose some kind of stability for the country on the long term. And the second piece is no to term limits either, because these judges or these people uh, during those uh, 
brief stints, even if it's brief as 15 years, could attempt gradually to influence things, to protect their own careers afterwards and become lobbyists or what have you, consultants afterwards. So yes, we should have Supreme Court judges nominated for life. Thanks for debating, Dirk, and thank you for listening, our dear podcast li- podcast listeners. This is what close to the sixtieth debate. Pretty pretty proud of that. Yeah, fifty sixth or fifty seventh. So we are yes. we are doing well. On that note, uh, we are hungry for feedback. So please share your opinions, share your arguments, leave a note on iTunes, in the comment section of the blog, what have you. We are everywhere and we are eager to hear back from our listeners. And if you have suggestions on debates we can cover, let us know. Uh, I think we've never run out of topics, but we've had some interesting suggestions, including lately on genetic engineering, so which came from uh, a couple of UCL students in the UK. So don't hesitate. If you have debates, motions that would be worth debating, let us know. All right. Thanks, Sebastian. Have a wonderful day. Likewise, Doug. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. I have to blurt that out. What would stop us from just giving them a continuous salary after their term ended? But you'd be I mean, lucky. it would be un- probably unconstitutional to block them from having a career. So you have to give them a job in order to no, keep them have, from having no, no, a not career? No, you have to give them a job. But if you block them from having a job, I think it's unconstitutional. Can you block someone from having a job? But that's exactly what we're doing right now. We basically say you sit on the Supreme Court so you're not having another job and here's your no, salary no, no. and you're so there you, for life. No, no, it's not so you don't you don't have to get another job. It's, it's, it's to say you don't have to get another job. You, but you're you busy be because you have that job. But you're what? <laughs> You're busy because you have that job. Well, hopefully you're busy enough, yes. Like, believe but, it or but, not, I was surprised and shocked a few years ago when I discovered that French MPs, members of parliament, uh, in most cases do not have to resign from their current jobs. You could, they actually, for some of them, continue working and are MPs, which I find crazy. Right? Because like, yeah, there's obvious conflict of interest. In, the, in some cases, they have to stop their activities, I think, for lawyers. Maybe for journalists as well, I can't remember exactly, but for others, if you're a doctor or an engineer, work for a private sector company with a non-regulated uh, job, you have no obligation to quit your job, which I found quite surprising. So they mm. accumulate salaries and compensation and there's all the conflicts of interest. So anyway, there's a much wider debate here in terms of the sanity and uh, preventing corruption and bribery but, and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but as I said, I... I, I do think it's not a contradiction in, in uh, per se. I would just say you're appointed to be Supreme Judge. Your term goes 15 years. You stay on the payroll because, you know, you made it to Supreme Judge. You won the lottery. So after those 15 years, you can go home to your farm in uh, nowhere, Will, and, uh, and, and, and herd sheeps if you want. And the, moment, and the moment you sign up for another career, well, then your, your, your salary at the Supreme Court kind of goes down 50% or stops or what have you. I, Why not? I don't think it will work, first of all, because I don't think these people, for their majority, would will want to stop working. I don't think these people work for money, necessarily. I think it's a lot to do with prestige also. Right? Like, oh, I'm in a position of power. And secondly, I think you'll never match the money that a private sector company can pay. So, so it is... It is a way to keep them occupied, right? So basically we say, oh, here, every once in a while, keep doing a ruling so you're off the street and you're not doing anything else. <laughs> well, in the case of Kaminoids, to avoid him drinking more beer and, and getting into fights at the local bar. Right? Oh, my God, yeah. Um, all right. Um, thank you, and thanks for adjusting the motion to adjust my notes and my double... My, my brain split that I had by doing a double negative. <laughs> I, I expected it when I, I wrote it down and I did not I did not change it, but then I'll, from now on I'll make sure that it's much clearer. <laughs> no, 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 because it's, it, it is confusing for anyone anyway to express it that way. What yeah. is your real opinion? My real opinion? Um, it, it, it better should be a really long term, but I really would cap it. 
I don't. I do think. I do think no one maintains a high level of quality, or only very few maintain a high level of quality over decades if there is no pressure to really maintain it. And I do think, for better or worse, uh, being appointed for life takes away every pressure. So at some point, uh, there is a risk that your ruling becomes more or less your opinion. And. Um, that is one thing I'm concerned about. The other thing is really fixing the status quo for 30, 40 years. Why why should we want that? I, I do think it's good that those... I, I would do a term that is about three or four times the term of the, the ruling president or something like that. So you, you ensure that a, a judge is independent from whatever is the wind of change in, in your country, but uh, still put a, put a limit to the, maybe, maybe having a reassessment moment. Why not having like after 15 years a moment where people can re-vote you and you stay in, in the court if you win those votes? What, what is wrong with such an idea? Yeah, that's my real, my real opinion on that. I agree with you. That was my default opinion and forced me to actually look into the reasons why you would not want that. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I'm, I'm, I actually don't know what I think <laughs> because, because I try to come up with like arguments I really think are valid. So now I'm confused. I think it's like for every debate. Now, now I really honestly, for most of our debates, I have no idea what to think. I'm <laughs> completely <laughs> in the middle of things. Like, okay, very good arguments on both sides. What what is the best thing? I don't know, um, but yeah, I, I tend to to side with your. I mean, I I know for sure I sided with your with your opinion before the debate, and uh, and now I I don't know. I just find it indeed a bit odd, especially as life expectancy, which I'm surprised I actually didn't bring up. But what if life expectancy goes to 150 years old in a century or two? Are you still gonna have? <laughs> lifelong appointments and you'll have people from two centuries back deciding on <laughs> things like abortion or you know AI implanted chips in your brain maybe 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 you should maybe indeed maybe you have you need to have someone from two centuries before so that they can put some perspective and say hang on do you really want to have these AI implanted chips in your brain I mean where is humanity going maybe it will become even more important actually like I'm actually laughing initially but then I'm starting to think seriously maybe this is what maybe you do want to rely on the older generation like we tend we tend when you when you're not old or that part of that generation just yet i think you, we tend to mock them a little bit or be a, be a bit sick and tired of only seeing you know gray hairs to be our politicians and our judges and i guess when you reach that age you want to be in power you still want to control something even though your destiny is pretty pretty much short-lived by definition but things may change in a century or two so there may be other reasons for nomination for life i don't know it could be odd. It yeah. could be odd for things like, you know, even for today, like for things like abortion. You know, when 80% of the world is religious, when all Supreme Court judges have ex- expressed religious affiliation, you know, Catholic or Jewish. It, yeah. it's, it, I find it scary. I find it extremely, like, backwards driven from, from that. But this is maybe a very short term perspective. You know, like, if you look at the next two or three centuries. You're talking about the U.S. Supreme Court, yeah, judges, yeah, the U.S. Supreme Court. right? It, it no. is true that we should not just be limited yeah. and restrict our discussion I mean, to the U.S. Yeah, and that's a very cultural thing as well. In in the U.S., uh, you you much rather you much rather vote a devote Catholic into office than a rocket scientist. If a rocket scientist tells you I don't believe in God, that kind of cuts half the voters out of the equation. Um, Whereas in, for instance, in France and in Germany, um, I, I, well, I'm not, I do believe in France. I know for sure in Germany that religion plays no role whatsoever in the entire process. So we are, we are having um, Christian parties and they are promoting Christian values, but it's not, it's not part of the election process. It's not part of the discussion. And you, you can be perfectly elected into high ranking office, but uh, even though you say you're an atheist. I don't see that happening in most of the positions in the states uh, at the same same level. Um, so I do think it's a cultural thing as well. Uh, feels scary to me, but that's also because I have a cultural bias on this. Um, probably it feels scary to Americans to look into our our uh, um, ungodly parliaments and uh, the kind of people we vote in. So, not I'm not I'm not making a judgment call on that. Um, other than that, being in the middle and confused, I feel the same pretty often when we debate. And I do think part of that is because we are a time-limited format. 
Um, but initially, it's, it's just serving the purpose that we intended, that we kind of discover that you have good arguments for each side. And then, then you have to go dig deeper to make up your mind. Yes.